everybody, I'd like to give you a brief explanation of this first experiment, or I'm sorry, of this experiment that I'm going to be talking about and demonstrating. Now, what this experiment is all about is preparing a solution. Now, in order to make a solution, generally it can be fairly simple, but sometimes it's it can be fairly complicated. For this, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making a solution of NaCl, a sodium chloride solution. Now, NaCl is table salt, and NaCl, whenever added to water, well, what's going to happen is it will dissociate into two independent ions. Now, sodium chloride, as it dissociates into these two independent ions, is going to serve as a great electrolyte. Now, great electrolytes are really wonderful at conducting electricity. So, okay, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be preparing this NaCl solution and subsequently making several dilutions. So, we will make a solution with a, an amount of NaCl and then we will dilute it. So we're going to prep a solution. And then dilute that. And then subsequently dilute that solution. <clears throat> and go over this dilution several different times. Now, in order to evaluate the solution, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be measuring conductivity. Now, like I said, electrolytic solutions or electrolytes are great at conducting electricity. Now, we don't have the perfect instrument or the best instrument for this. The best instrument is going to measure um, units known as, or it's going to measure conductivity. Conductivity is measured in units known as Siemens. That's an N per meter. Now the instrument that we have isn't capable of doing that or the, the probe that we're using isn't capable of doing that, but we're going to be measuring voltage. And we're going to be measuring that kind of as an expression of, well, we're going to see it change based on the electrolytic strength of our solution. So we're going to be comparing a total of three different solutions or well, five different solutions. Um, we're going to be comparing a solution of NaCl. We're going to be comparing deionized water or DH2O. We're going to be comparing that to a solution of CaCO3 and a solution of KCl. And then finally, we're going to compare all of that to a solution of sucrose. Now, the purpose of this lab is to demonstrate how to make a solution. What is the process? In addition to that, we're also going to be comparing solutions with different electrolytic strength. So comparing electrolytes. We're comparing electrolytes to non-electrolytes. Oopsies, that's supposed to electrolytes. Um, so comparing these different solutions to one another so that you can kind of uh, begin to look at how these different things relate to one another and ultimately you can relate them to solubility. So whether or not something dissolves and dissociates in water is another thing to take into consideration, something that we're evaluating in this experiment. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started in the next few, uh, or in the next little bit. So for this exercise, I'm going to walk you through some of the, the parts of the PDF. 
um, that you guys all have access to. And I'm going to introduce you to some of the materials that we're going to be using in this lab. Um, so this lab is all about, like I said, conductivity, measuring conductivity, and um, making solutions. Making a solution is your primary focus. And then secondary, you can compare different things. So what we're doing is we are comparing electrolytes from non-electrolytes, as is indicated here and here. And we're also comparing a molecular solution. Now, as we scroll through this, um, you'll see there's quite a bit of background information. Conductivity is the is a measurement of the ability of an aqueous solution to transfer an electrical current. The current is carried by ions, and therefore conductivity increases with the concentration of ions present in the solution, their mobility, and the temperature of the water. Okay, all of our experiments are going to be done at room temperature, which is approximately 25 degrees Celsius, 23 to 25 degrees Celsius, varies a little bit. And sometimes you might hear that temperature measured in Kelvin, which is another unit. If you haven't talked about that yet in your Chem 1341 class, no worries. Um, you will be talking about that before too long. So all substances possess some degree of conductivity. In aqueous solutions, the level of ionic strength varies from low conductivity of ultra pure water to high conductivity of highly concentrated chemical samples. Electrolytes are compounds that form ions in aqueous solutions. The term refers to the ability of the ions to conduct electricity through water. So just imagine that the more ions that you have in solution, um, the higher your conductivity is. So if you compared something like, I'm going to go ahead and say, you know, a topical for what we're doing, we're comparing NaCl, which is highly soluble, which is very aqueous, so it will separate into Na plus and Cl minus versus something like CaCO3, which although it is aqueous, it's much less soluble in water. Chances are that this is actually going to continue to remain as CaCO3 um, rather than separating into those two ions. So my question here is, is this ions? Yeah, it's two charged substances. Meanwhile, this right here, ions? No, it's not. These are not ions. They're not going to separate into ions. And so you would expect low conductivity versus high conductivity. Um, so we're drawing a correlation basically between the ability of something to uh, conduct electricity, conduct an electric current, and the ability of something to exist as ions in solution. Okay, so a good demonstration of this, as you've probably seen in your textbook, is shown in figure one. When electrolytes are present in a solution, electricity can, tra can travel through water to complete a circuit and therefore light a light bulb. So what we have here is a difference of several different samples. We've got ethanol, we've got KCl or potassium chloride, and we've got an acetic acid solution. Now acetic acid is not a strong acid, it is known as a weak acid. And so it's not going to separate into individual ions very easily. So we have ethanol, which is not going to conduct electricity because ethanol is going to be a solution made up of, well, individual ethanol molecules. KCl, potassium chloride, will separate into potassium ions and KCl ions, or I'm sorry, <laughs> potassium ions and chloride ions. So think about this as, I, I always have a tendency to think about it if I have 100 KCl, 100 molecules of KCl. Well, when I add water to it, that's going to separate into 100 K plus and 100 Cl minus. Now, if we compare that to acetic acid, and this is something you'll get into a little bit more when it comes to um, Chem 2, but let's think about having acetic acid or the acetate ion, CH3, COO minus, that's your acetate ion. Acetic acid is CH3COOH, okay? Now, if you have 100 of these, since acetic acid is a weak acid, what you'd probably end up with is a mixture of, let's just call it 50 CH3, sorry. So coming from this original mixture of 100 CH3COOH, 50 CH3COOH, O H, that's poorly written. Let me erase that. Uh, 
Uh, there's the draw function. CH3, C, O, O, H. So we've got from our original 100, we added water to that. We got 50 CH3, C, O, O, H. So 50 of those original 100 molecules are going to continue to exist in that same form. But then we're also going to get 50 CH3, C, O, O minus and 50 H plus. So what we see here is we have a total of 200 ions resulting from our original 100 KCl. So that means there's 100 potassium ions, 100 chloride ions. Then if we look at 100 molecules of acetic acid, or yeah, acetic acid, well, we're gonna get 50 that do not dissociate at all, 50 that do. And so what we're going to end up with is 100 ions. Okay, so we have something that can very easily conduct electricity and conduct electricity very well. That is potassium chloride because it's going to dissociate into a total of 200 ions. Then we have something that's not quite as good, but is still capable, and that would be something like your acetic acid solution. Okay, now that's what we're aiming to compare here. So figure one shows that comparison of ethanol, something that's not going to conduct electricity, potassium chloride, and acetic acid solutions. Okay, figure one also demonstrates that our different types of electrolytes, strong electrolytes, which is KCL is an example of a strong electrolyte, and acetic acid, which is considered a weak electrolyte. So we can kind of visualize that with the intensity of these two light bulbs. Our high conductor of electricity is our high or our strong electrolyte, and it produces a large amount of light compared to our weak electrolyte and our therefore low conductor this acetic acid, well, your flashlight is a little bit more dim. Okay, so this gives us a good comparison of a strong and a weak electrolyte. What we're aiming to do is we're aiming to work with sodium chloride, which is a strong electrolyte. A weak electrolyte or a weaker electrolyte is something that's not going to dissociate very well. And for this experiment, what we're aiming to do is we're aiming to look at the weak electrolyte of calcium carbonate, okay? So what we are going to do is we are going to be using, like I said previously, we're going to be using our LabQuest. Um, the LabQuest is a small piece of uh, uh, instrumentation. It's basically a little handheld computer almost that we're going to connect a uh, pH probe to it or pH meter. Now that's going to give us a rough idea of voltage um, an electric current that's running through the sample. It's not the perfect option, but it's a, a reasonable option. Because what we're really aiming to do is what we're, uh, we're aiming to, um, sorry, what we're really aiming to do is we're aiming to look at um, different making solutions and making subsequent dilutions of those solutions. Okay, so for part one of this experiment, you're going to uh, prepare solutions. You're going to need in your bin a couple of different things. You're going to have several large beakers. You're going to have a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder and several 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flasks. Okay, so for the with one of those large beakers, you're going to get deionized water. Now, this is an important thing to distinguish from any other type of water that you use in the lab. Deionized water, well, this is absolutely pertinent and appropriate, we're talking about ions. And so we're talking about using deionized water, water that ions have been removed from. So in theory, what we've got is nothing but DH2O. Or sorry, what we've got is nothing but H2O in there. So we're going to collect that into a large beaker. That's going to be serving as our water reservoir for the rest of our experiment, okay? Now, we will then transfer 0 0.80 grams of sodium chloride, as is demonstrated here. The first thing that you need to do whenever you're making a solution is know the exact mass of the material that you're going to be dissolving in water or adding to your solution. So in order to do that, you have to balance or you have to um, use a digital balance to collect the material that you're weighing out. What I'm demonstrating here 
is what happens whenever you turn a digital balance on. What you'll notice is that there's a countdown. And then finally, whenever it registers a zero, I'm going to put my way boat, my blue way boat on this balance. Then I'm going to press this button that shows two arrows pointing to T. That means to tear the balance or zero it out. So anything that's on there will register at zero grams. Now that we've zeroed out our balance, we know that we're going to be collecting 0 0.800 grams of NACL and adding that to my balance or adding that to our weigh boat. Now, one thing that you'll notice is this digital balance goes to two numbers beyond the decimal place or to the right of the decimal place. So we'll only be able to accurately measure out 0 0.80 grams of NACL. So I'll use what's known as a scupula or a spatula to transfer from my original source to my weigh boat and see that I have 0 .80 grams of NACL added to my weigh boat. We'll transfer that 0 .80 grams of sodium chloride onto one of your 120 or into, I'm sorry, one of your 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flasks. Using your graduated cylinder, collect 100 milliliters of DH2O from that first reservoir of DH2O. Okay, so you'll collect 100 milliliters of deionized water and transfer all of that to your Erlenmeyer flask that has the 0 0.80 grams of sodium chloride. So now what you have is you have a mass of sodium chloride and you have a volume. So this gives you a means to calculate a concentration. And I'm just going to show this calculation right here, um, even though it will be used later on in your data sheet. Okay. So we have 0 0.80 grams of NaCl. We have 58.5 grams of NaCl. And that is one mole of NaCl. What we want to do is we want to use our calculator, which I have one somewhere around my desk. Ugh, escaping me at the moment, so I'll use my telephone. I'm going to take 0 0.80, 0 0.8 divided by 58.5. That's going to tell me I have approximately 0 0.1 or 0 0.01. Four moles of NaCl. Okay, so 0.014 moles of NaCl, and that is in 0 0.1 liters. So what I like to do is I like to remember that 100 milliliters is equal to 0 0.1 liters. Okay, so I'll take that 0.014 divided by 0.1, and that gives me a molarity a solution with a molarity of 0 0.14 molar. Okay, so I'm working with a 0 0.14 molar solution. Okay, so that's the first solution that I've made. I'm going to go ahead and store that number on a piece of paper for myself because I'll revisit that 0 0.14. All right, I'm going to clear that drawing right there because I'm going to be proceeding onward. Now, that is my first solution that I'm going to make. And what I want to make sure of is I want to make sure that all of my sodium chloride that I added to that Erlenmeyer flask gets completely dissolved. Now, using your graduated cylinder, also collect 100 milliliters of DH2O and transfer it to your other Erlenmeyer flask. Label this piece of glassware as your number two, which is the DH2O. So at this point, you have two solutions. One is the NaCl solution that you made that's 0.14 molar NaCl. The second is nothing but DH2O. And now you're having to make a third solution. Now this third solution is your standardization solution. So this is what you're going to compare everything to. So this standardization solution for our exercise is KCl that potassium chloride. If you remember, we talked about potassium chloride as a strong electrolyte. So this is something that's really good at conducting electricity. So basically we've got kind of bookends, a bookend sort of solutions. We've got something that's really good at conducting electricity, our potassium chloride solution. 
Then we've got our DH2O, something that's not very good at conducting electricity. What we're going to be evaluating is that NaCl solution that we're making. So we're expecting that that NaCl solution, well, it's not going to be as bad a conductor as NaCl, and it's maybe not going to be as good a conductor as KCl. So that's kind of our range that we want to live within. Okay. So we have a total of three solutions right here. And these three solutions are NaCl, KCl, and DH2O. Okay. Now, I'm going to kind of breeze through using the conductivity probe um, and show you what uh, the results are going to look like there. But I'm going to move on down. One of the things that I will say about using the conductivity probe or the, uh, the pH meter is that at the bottom of this pH meter is a glass bulb that is very, very sensitive. It's a semi-porous material that in the event that it's cracked, well, that piece of equipment is basically is, is non-functional. It's not going to work very well at all. Okay, so <clears throat> we've made our solutions. I'm breezing through the measurement of those um, conductivity. And now I'm gonna move on to our trends and making our different solutions. So at this point in the procedure, you've measured the conductivity of three different solutions. What we are going to do <coughs> is we are going to, sorry, my mouse is a little bit fin finicky. Um, we are going to use that the, the solution that we made, the 0 0.14 molar NaCl solution, and we're going to dilute it. Okay. And we're going to dilute it for the purpose of measuring um, the conductivity of this. So I want to talk about this 0 0.14 molar NaCl solution. So keep in mind what we were talking about earlier in terms of like if you had 100 molecules of KCl and you dissolved it in water, you'd have you would have these ions that separate. So you'd have 100 potassium ions and you'd have 100 chloride ions, okay? Now, what we've got basically is this NaCl solution that's going to be a 0.14 molar NaCl solution. So that means that it's 0 0.14 molar Na plus and 0 0.14 molar Cl minus. Now that seems a little bit weird just because of the fact that, well, we started with one concentration and now all of a sudden we've lost nothing. Well, the way that I think about concentration is I think about this molecule, this NaCl, it's made up of two things. And those two things, well, if you have a 0.14 molar um, concentration of that one thing, well, you're going to have 0.14 molar concentration of each of those individual kind of uh, separate pieces. So if this helps at all, I always kind of think about, um, I like to think about larger numbers and I like to think about a, a number that's easy for me to kind of imagine. So if you have 1,000 um, sports, 1,000 1, trucks, okay, let's think about what that truck consists of. It can, consists of um, a body and it consists of four wheels, okay? So if you have 100 trucks and you dissociate and you break that thing down, or if you break all those individual trucks down, you'll end up with 400 wheels because each one of those trucks has four wheels. You'll also end up with 100 truck bodies. And this is an example. You could go on and you find um, other pieces, but this is particularly confusing. This I, I found always confusing for me, um, thinking about well, how did I have this and I broke it down and somehow I my concentration hasn't changed. Well, the reason for that is because you have complete dissociation of these two ions. Okay. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to take this 0.14 molar solution of NaCl. And we are going to make a dilution. So what we're going to do is we're going to carefully transfer 50 milliliters of the solution that we prepared 
using a graduated cylinder. So we're going to take our 100 milliliter graduated cylinder, transfer 50 milliliters to that graduated cylinder, okay? Then um, transfer that subsequently to our clean or our dry Erlenmeyer flask. Then we're going to add 50 milliliters of deionized water to our graduated cylinder um, that we're then going to add to that Erlenmeyer flask. So if we think about it like this, we have E flask one. That first Erlenmeyer flask consists of, I'm not very good at drawing Erlenmeyer flasks. Um, this is 100 mils of our 0 0.14 molar NaCl solution. To that, we're going to take 50 mils, and we're going to put that in our Erlenmeyer flask, or I'm sorry, our grad cylinder, and then 50 mils of it is going to go to waste. Okay. So we've taken half of it, and to that half, we're going to add 50 mils DH2O. All right, so we've basically diluted it in a one-to-one -one dilution. And so what that means is, well, this dilution number one has a concentration, a NaCl concentration, that is half of our starting solution. So if our starting solution had a concentration of 0.14 molar NaCl, well, dilution number one is going to have half of that. So 0 0.14 divided by two equals 0 0.07 molar NaCl. So now to bring this back to concentration of individual ions, if the concentration of NaCl <coughs> is 0.007 molar, that means our concentration of Na plus and Cl minus are both 0 0.07 molar. All right, so once you've made that dilution, you're going to measure uh, the using the conductivity probe or the pH probe, we're going to measure our conductivity of that. You would expect, and what we expect from this is, whatever our conductivity was of that first sample, we would expect our conductivity of this newly diluted sample to not necessarily be half, but certainly to be less than that, or to be less than the conductivity of our first sample. Okay, so what we will do after this is we'll proceed and we'll compare this to our standardization solution, that KCL solution, and we'll compare it to deionized water. <clears throat> we'll continue to do this for several more dilutions. We'll do dilution number two and dilution number three and then dilution number four, okay? Each one of them following the exact same path. So if we say, our stock NaCl solution was 0 0.14 molar. Our dilution number one was 0 0.07 molar. And we followed the exact same process for making all of these subsequent dilutions. Well, what would you imagine that the concentration of dilution number two is? Well, we took this stock and divided it by two to get the 0 0.07. Okay, so that got us there. I'm drawing an arrow over an arrow, I apologize for that. So this 0 0.07, we're going to divide that by two and that will give us, so I'm gonna, dilution number one has a concentration of 0 0.07, our stock, just so this isn't as confusing. Dilution number two, well, what's our what's our concentration of that going to be? Well, that's 0 0.07 divided by 2 equals 0 0.035 molar. We're going to divide 
So that would be our concentration for dilution number two. So then if we get dilution number three, because we're going all the way to dilution number four, in dilution number, sorry, dilution number three and dilution number four. Dilution number three, well, it's going to be half as concentrated. So 0 0.035 divided by two is going to give us a concentration that is 0 0.0175. Divide this by two. So I'm going to, again, circle dilution number three's concentration is 0 0.0175. Then dilution number four, Divide that by two equals 0 0.00, 0, oh, 0 0.00875. And there's our concentration for dilution number four. Now, there are a couple of ways that you can do this. So what we did was we just said, well, <clears throat> we took 50 milliliters from our first sample and we took 50 milliliters of DH2O, so we added one part DH2O and equal part of our stock solution, therefore that's what we got. What I would recommend, okay, so I'm gonna write all these numbers down, I'm gonna hold, hold on to these, 0 0.07, 0 0.035, 0 0.0175, and finally 0 0.0875. This is gonna be useful for the data table that we're going to fill in in just a little while. Um, I'm going to clear all my drawings. And what I'm going to zoom in to do is give myself basically a white space to work on so that I can do some writing. And I don't think my, oh, good, good. My text isn't going to be crazy large or anything like that. Okay. So, one equation that's very helpful to be comfortable using is, well, kind of falls into two different uh, categories. Um, you might hear it referred to as C1V1 equals C2V2. Or you might also have it introduced to you as M1 V1 equals M2 V2. Okay. The heart of this basically ends up being the same though. Okay. So C1 V1 equals C2 V2 is concentration of solution number one times the volume of solution number one is equal to the concentration of solution number two times the volume of solution number two. Um, M1V1 equals M2V2, well, the V still stands for volume, M stands for molarity. Um, they're both the exact same equation, and it's just that some people say C1V1, some people prefer M1V1. All right, so what I wanna do is I wanna talk about dilution number one using this particular equation, C1V1 equals C2V2, okay? Now, what do we know about making dilution number one? And what we really need to worry about there is if we are making dilution number one, what we need to be concerned with is what um, is dilution number one, um, volume one, concentration one, what does it really mean? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to say, how do I make dilution number one, question mark. Okay, so what I do know about this is I'm taking 50 milliliters from my stock solution. Okay, now what do I know about that stock solution? That stock solution is the sample that we prepared. That had a concentration, I'm gonna say stock, concentration was 0 0.14 molar, okay? So then what I'm going to do with that is I'm gonna say, well, I'm making dilution number one. Do I know the concentration of dilution number one? At this point, I don't. I know that I just walked through all those calculations, but I wanna show you this as if we don't know it at all. Okay, so do I know the concentration of dilution number one? No, I don't. Do I know the total volume that dilution number one will be? Yes, I do. Dilution number one is going to be 50 mils of stock 
plus of that stock solution, 50 milliliters of DH2O. So based on those two, what's the total volume of this solution? That total, or the solution's total volume is going to be 100 milliliters. All right, so we've got these variables, but what we don't know is the dill number one concentration. This equals question mark, question mark, question mark. Okay. So if you look at your equation, you've got two things on the left side, two things on the right side. What we now have is a total of three variables. So with these three variables, well, we only need to solve for one of them. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say stock concentration is my C1. My V1 is going to be the volume from my stock solution. Okay, so that's going to be my V1. So I've got C1 and I've got V1. Now, the C2 is the concentration for dilution number one. And V2 is going to be my total volume. So I can set this up as 0 0.14 times 50, because that's C1. And I'm going to write C1 over this, C1 times V1. And I'm going to set that equal to C2, V2. So do I know my C2? No, I do not. That's what I'm going to be solving for. Do I know my V2? Yes, I do. That's going to be the total volume of my solution. Now, one thing that's worth noting is I'm not writing down my units. And the reason for that is I don't really need to worry about my units at this point in time. Because, well, I don't need to worry about them because I know that the concentration, this, this variable that I'm solving for, this is going to be in units of molarity. And I just bring that up because from time to time, you might have a question that gives you millimolar of this substance and molar of this substance. So you might have to reconcile those two things. You might have to make those kind of uh, work with one another. But I have uh, my V1 is written in, volume, in milliliters, and my V2 is also written in milliliters. So 0 0.14 times 50 divided by 100. I'm going to divide each side of this equation by 100, and therefore I can get rid of um, those units. So I'm going to be left with C2 is equal to 0 0.14 times 50 divided by 100. I'm going to plug that into my calculator. I always like to use as many parentheses as possible, so i got to switch to, oh, the silly, this mode. Yeah, that one, so then I can punch my parentheses in. So I'm going to open parentheses, open parentheses, uh, it doesn't pop up, 0. 0.14 times 50, close parentheses, divided by 100 equals 0. 0.07. And that's great, because that's what I said earlier, 0. 0.07 molar. And you can continue doing that all the way down the line, figuring out what is your concentration for this solution, what's your concentration for that solution, and so on. Um, the most critical part, and maybe the most challenging part of this whole equation, is figure out which is C1, which is V1, which is C2, which is V2. Um, and so what I always like to do is I always like to think about what am I going from and what am I making. When I do that, then I can say, okay, well, my V2 is my total volume. My C1 is my starting concentration. My V1 is my starting volume. It's helpful. It's not necessarily going to be across the board, but this is something that with practice, and here you've got, uh, let's see, that would be four examples or four kind of practice problems that you can use that are built in here. So what's the concentration of dilution number one? What's the concentration of dilution number two? And so on. And this has a fixed ratio of 50 mils of the stock makes, or you add that to 50 milliliters of DH2O and you continue doing that down the line. 
Okay, so now I'm gonna zoom back out and I'm gonna scroll on down here. Okay, so that's essentially this key part of the experiment. So what we have are those concentrations. So we've got the concentration for dilution number one, dilution number two, dilution number three, dilution number four, as well as that stock solution. Now, those are all of the values that you're going to use, and I'm scrolling down fairly quickly here. Those are the values that you are going to use. Uh oh, something just happened. Nope, it didn't happen. As you continue on down the line to fill in all of this right here. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and start filling this part out to help you out, um, just to keep this straight. So NaCl, we're expecting that to be a strong electrolyte. The weight of NaCl that we use is, well, 0 0.80 grams. Now, one thing that's worth noting about that is the instrument that we use to measure, or the balance that we used had a limitation. It couldn't weigh out to 0 0.8000 grams. It could only weigh out to 0 0.80 grams. So that only takes us to the hundreds position. So we're limited to two significant figures there. Okay. The number of moles of NaCl that we had. Okay. We just solved for that a little bit ago. I feel kind of silly because I, I didn't write that down, but I think that was 0 0.014 moles. Or was it? Yeah, it was 0.14. The total volume of our solution was 100 milliliters. This cell D and cell E ask you to make that conversion. 100 milliliters is 0 0.1 liters. Now this cell F or variable F asks us what's the concentration of our NaCl solution in moles per liter. And that is going to be 0 0.14 moles per liter or large M molarity. Now, <clears throat> scroll down a little bit. And unfortunately, I'm using Zoom, so my recording and all kind of uh, whatever I annotated there is going to, to go with me. <clears throat> I'm going to um, post your conductivity on, another, on an Excel document that you'll have to pull out use that and fill in this data or fill in that data. But here I'm going to go ahead and clear all my drawings. So hold off on G, you'll find that in another document. Um, then we'll scroll down. Flask number two, our DH2O solution. Is that a strong or weak electrolyte or a non-electrolyte? Well, DH2O, if anything, it's probably going to be a weak electrolyte. The total volume of our solution was 100 milliliters. The conductivity, again, that's going to be posted in an Excel document. And I'm going to see the, I'm going to post that Excel document showing G and J. So you'll look for those in the Excel document. Um, the total volume of your solution, sorry, for flask number three, that's that KCL standardization solution. That's 100 milliliters, and you'll have the conductivity of that. After this, we start to get into more complicated and challenging parts of the equation. Um, we've got flask number three, and that is our, or I'm sorry, missed that one. Um, um, so that flask number three, I'll, that KCL solution was 0 0.1 molar. Um, and so, that was a 0.1 molar solution. You had 100 milliliters of it. The conductivity is the same as what you saw up here in the cell L. Um, dilution number one was flask number four, dilution number two, dilution number three, dilution number four. These are all things that, well, you'll have to figure these out. You'll be given, based on these uh, cells, you'll be given um, Excel documents to look at, or an Excel document to look at. So that sums up making a solution, and making subsequent dilutions of that solution. Now, the next thing that we're going to look at is table number three. I'm gonna scroll actually back up to the top so we can look at the procedure and how the procedure addresses this. Um, so part number four here is measuring the conductivity of sucrose 
and of calcium carbonate. Now, sucrose has a molecular formula of C12, and I gotta get my annotation tool out. Okay, so sucrose has a molecular formula of C12, H22, O11. Okay, now what sucrose looks like, this is also known, if you go on to take a biochemistry class, um, you'll learn about sugars, and this is known as a disaccharide. So C C H A R I D E. I always screw up the spelling of disaccharide. Um, and what this consists of and what it kind of looks like is, I'm going to draw a very crude representation of it. All these points are, um, so it's a bunch of carbons and oxygens and hydrogens. Um, and basically it looks like this. Each one of these points, like right here, 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 these are all examples, those are all carbons. So it's a two carbon ring structure, uh, each ring consisting of six members. Um, and that's basically what it looks like. Sucrose is a sugar, it's a disaccharide. It's something that, well, it's a good example of a molecular compound. Um, and it is not going to be very good at all at conducting electro uh, electricity. This is such a, uh, such a weak electrolyte that's basically not even considered an electrolyte, okay? So that's one of the compounds. The other compound is calcium carbonate. Now calcium carbonate is something that you're, you've actually come in uh, contact with or been near many times, and that is CaCO3, but this is chalk. Now, <clears throat> in the event that you've ever written on a chalkboard or something like that, um, <clears throat> it makes a very, very fine powder and that gets kind of caught in the grooves of your, of your skin and your fingers. And so washing it off is kind of a, um, it, it's, I don't know if it's frustrating or a tedious process necessarily, but it doesn't um, come off very easily. Um, that's not to say it's impossible, but what that's an indicator of is, or one thing, sorry, worth noting about calcium carbonate is this is a weak electrolyte. And calcium carbonate is not very soluble, very soluble in DH2O. Now in the solution that I'm going to show you guys in the video, um, you'll be able to see that DH, sorry, that it doesn't go into solution very well. In fact, the solution is kind of cloudy. So what we'd expect from this calcium carbonate is we're not going to be able to conduct electricity very well because of the fact that it's not very soluble in solution. Um, so this part of the procedure has you basically comparing those two substances to all these aqueous solutions. So with this aqueous solution, we wanted to see the conductivity go down as we saw the concentration go down. Now, sucrose, calcium carbonate, neither of those are going to go into solution very, or sorry, sucrose is going to dissolve very easily, but it's not going to dissolve into ions. Instead, it's going to dissolve as individual molecules floating around. And so they're not going to be very effective at conducting electricity. That's not to say that they can't, but they're just not going to be as good as something like potassium chloride or sodium chloride or something like that. Calcium carbonate is also not going to be very soluble in water. And so it's going to do a very bad job of conducting electricity. Okay, so essentially what you're going to do is you're going to compare these beakers or these Erlenmeyer flasks with, or sorry, you're going to add sucrose and calcium carbonate to Erlenmeyer flasks. You're going to, you're going to compare them to um, DH2O and you'll also compare them to your uh, standardization solution. So if we scroll on down to the last page, what you'll have is flask number eight that shows you DH2O, and flask number nine that shows you sucrose, flask number 10 that's CaCO3. I stand corrected, you don't have to compare this to your uh, standardization solution. But from these, we would expect to see, well, none of these are going to be very good 
at conducting electricity. So we would expect their conductivity to be considerably lower than that of the NaCl, the potassium chloride solutions that we've seen. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be using all of this data. You're going to be uh, filling in the last, let's see, that would be pages seven through 10 to fill in all of this information. So some of these things you might have to go back on, um, like ethanol. Uh, we already looked at ethanol as a, uh, that was shown earlier in the, the, the presentation on it being not a particularly good electrolyte. Um, sucrose, KCL, acetic acid, HCL. Think about these different compounds and whether or not they're aqueous in solution. Now, I don't expect you to have the context for sucrose, um, but judging by what we've talked about here, and then you might be able to look in your textbook for um, soluble compounds, um, use that information to suggest whether or not something's a strong weak or a non-electrolyte. Now, the last one on here is tap water, okay? So what we're using is we've been using deionized water because, well, we've removed all the ions, okay? So we wouldn't expect that to be particularly good as an electrolyte, but tap water, think about that, especially here in Central Texas. Um, your tap water in Central Texas has a bunch of ions. It has a bunch of limestone. It has a bunch of uh, calcium carbonate, magnesium, chloride ions floating around, or magnesium ions and chloride ions floating around in it. Um, in San Marcos, we don't have fluorine or fluoride ions floating around anymore because that was removed a few years ago. Um, but it's quite common to have lots of ions floating around in your tap water, in which case, do you think that tap water is going to be better at conducting electricity than deionized water? Or do you think deionized water will be better at conducting electricity than tap water? Okay, so, You'll have to look on your Canvas page for an Excel document that has the conductivity measurements. Um, but go ahead and fill all this information in and submit this, and that is your experiment for the conductivity lab. All right, well, I hope this is helpful. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, email me or get in contact with me. All right, have a good one.